Good afternoon, everyone. Today, we are very to have Shota Komatsu from CERN, although locally in California, who will tell us about cross-cap states in integrable field theories and spin chains. So please, Shota, the floor is yours. Okay, thank you, Hugo, for uh, introduction. So, so today I'm gonna talk about this, uh, this work, like which is about cross-cap states in integrable field theories and spin chains, uh, which is based on the work or the paper that we published uh, last November, if I'm correct, together with Joao Caetano, uh, who is a postdoc at CERN. Okay, so, so let me just start with uh, saying like, what is cross-cap? Because uh, maybe like a cross-cap is not very familiar subject for uh, too many people. So basically the cross-cap is often uh, studied in 2D conformal field theory. Uh, there is a long history of studying cross-cap state in 2D conformal field theory. And to construct the cross-cap state, basically you consider a complex plane, uh, which is 2D complex plane, and perform this identification Z going to minus one over Z bar. And if you do this, do this identification, you are going to identify a point inside a unit disk and with the point outside a unit disk. So the fundamental domain uh, after doing this identification can be taken to be the out exterior of the unit disk. So this is the kind of fundamental domain. And at the boundary, we are going to uh, perform some identification, which comes from this identification. And that is to identify points at antipodal uh, uh, locations. So, so because of this, like we can alternatively say that you can construct the cross cap by just cutting out the disk from the unit disk from the uh, complex plane and perform antipodal identification. And if you dis do this identification, then you can like uh, you can probably understand that like uh, the surface becomes non-orientable. So this is a canonical way of, for example, constructing uh, maybe a strip or from, from a disk or like a climb bottle. And so this is kind of like a definition of a surface, but uh, because we, I, uh, because as I said, like the fundamental domain is the exterior of the unit disk. And if you view uh, this region in which we perform the identification from outside, it looks like it's creating some particular state. Much like if you put a boundary here, you are going to get a boundary state if you view it from out outside. So this is the definition of the cross cap state in 2D conformal field theory. So, so this is the main subject of my talk. And what I'm going to talk about is to explain like what happens if you consider cross cap state in massive uh, integrable quantum field theory or spin chains instead of 2D conformal field theory. So the punchline of my talk is the following. So the punchline, the first punchline is that the, if you consider integrable field theory or integrable spin chains, then the integrability survives even in the presence of cross caps. So, in, so, the, so the main message to, uh, to take is the cross cap is integrable. And furthermore, if you consider the overlap between the cross cap state and an excited state, that can be computed analytically both in field theory and spin chain. And it, it has a very simple formula. And in the paper, we also discuss a little bit of like other things, uh, but I don't have time to talk about this, but like, uh, but just to mention, uh, we also discuss some generalization of what's called the homological staircase model to D series minimal models. And we also discuss some fermionization of integrable field series. Okay, so this is the plan of the talk. Uh, let me just uh, now, I will first talk about uh, why we are interested in cross caps. And then I'm going to talk about cross cap overlap in integral field theory first, and then spin chain, and then conclude. Okay, so so why cross cap? But before talking about about why cross caps, uh, let me just first mention why uh, boundaries are interesting. So as I said, the cross caps are kind of like a weird analog of the boundary states. So let me just first motivate why studying boundary boundaries are interesting is interesting. So the boundaries in one plus one D one dimensional systems have attracted much attention in the past. And one successful, very much successful example is what's called the condo problem. So, so the condo problem is the following. So if you, uh, so in the past, like people, 
uh, analyze the uh, resistivity, electrical, electrical resistivity of the metal like gold. And then what they observe is that like uh, uh, if you do compute the, if you measure the uh, resistivity as a function of temperature in the experiment, then uh, there is a, a anomalous kind of increase uh, near zero, tem zero temperature, which deviates from the standard theoretical prediction. And the model that uh, Kondo proposed to describe this anomalous behavior uh, is the model which basically consists of free fermion and some magnetic impurity. So basically Kondo tried to explain this behavior uh, from, uh, as coming from the magnetic impurity. And of course, like this model is defined in three plus one dimensions, but if you do the S wave reduction and consider the scattering of free fermion, uh, which describes their electron against magnetic impurity, then uh, it, you can reduce it to one plus one dimensional fermion with boundary. And this system uh, can be studied in ver by various methods like integrability or conformal field theory. And let me also just mention that uh, the same effective one plus one dimensional system often shows up in completely different contexts, uh, which is uh, called the kalan rubikov effect, uh, which is basically like a uh, scattering of monopoles and, uh, uh, and, uh, and fermions. So, so this is the uh, successful example, uh, but of course, like a, apart from that, that's also a boundary in two dimensional conformal fields here is also important for uh, for understanding the deep brains in string theory, as we know. And in addition, uh, more in most recent years, uh, people studied the boundary state in CFD and spin chains in the context of quantum quench. And there has been a series of work, there have been a series of works like this. And even more recently, uh, this idea, this uh, overlap boundary state in spin chains uh, appeared in the study of N equals for super mills because some like uh, some observables in n equals for mills can be mapped to the uh, overlap between a boundary state and the uh, energy eigenstate of some spin chain, which describe the operator in n equals for mills. Okay, so however, so 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 far I was motivating uh, why boundaries are interesting, but in two D CFTs there exists another class of important states, uh, which is called uh, cross cap. And that's, that's important. Uh, that was studied uh, in several different contexts. For example, uh, that's also important when you want to analyze uh, two plus one dimensional symmetry protected topological phase with time reversal symmetry, because this 2D system on orientable surfaces uh, appears as a boundary. And you can, well, you can put this system in a kind of like a, in a manifold, whose boundary is non-orientable surfaces. And, and also like uh, it was also studied in the context of string theory, because if you consider the string worksheet with a cross cap, then in space time that describes the oriented fold. And oriented fold played an important role in various string compactifications. In particular, uh, especially recently, like uh, people studied that of uh, orient, people studied oriented fold in the context of DS vacua constructing DS vacua. And the, right, the reason why people study uh, oriented fold in DS vacua is because of, uh, one, one reason is because of the famous Maudacena Nunez no go theorem, uh, which basically claims that if you just uh, take a usual supergravity uh, and then like a, you use the usual matter, which obeys the usual like a uh, energy condition, then you cannot construct uh, uh, DS vacua. And the way to like avoid this no go theorem is either to use some non protective effects like coming from D, in, D instantons. And those are basically like the idea of KKLT. And the other approach is to use, the, use some object, uh, which is uh, like a unusual energy, con which satisfies unusual energy condition. And that's, a that's uh, actually uh, oriented fold because uh, oriented fold sometimes has negative tension. And, uh, However, um, uh, I should say that there are, uh, in the past, there has been almost no literature uh, about the cross cap states in integrable field series and spin chains because most people studied oriented fold only in two dimensional conformal field theory. And 
So that's uh, the filling the gaps is basically the main aim of my talk. And another thing I wanted to say is that, uh, as we will see, that if you consider the cross cap states in spin chain rather than in field theory, then it provides a new integrable uh, initial state for quantum quench, and which is completely different from like a boundary state people often use in the quantum quench. For example, it has long range entangle entanglement and it exhibits a volume law of entanglement entropy. Okay, so, so far I motivated uh, why studying the cross cap is interesting. So let me now move on to the actual computation in integrable field series. But before moving on, uh, is there any question? So, okay, so if not, let's proceed. So, so the main thing that I want to compute is, as I said, uh, the overlap between the cross cap state and some uh, energy eigenstate in integrable, massive integral quantum field theory. So the setup that I'm going to discuss uh, in order to compute this quantity is the following. So we take a cylinder and uh, contract the two boundaries here and here with the cross cap state. So it's a little bit hard to imagine like a, what kind of topology we are going to get after doing this, but uh, it is known that this uh, geometry is actually a Klein bottle. So basically I'm considering the Klein bottle partition function. Hi, um, uh, yes. sorry, can, can I ask a very naive question? Yes. What exactly is a cross cap state? Okay, so yes, so let me see. So the cross cap state, Right, so, so uh, as I mentioned in the beginning of the talk, the cross cap state uh, can be defined by identifying uh, a point on a circle. So basically like a, if you are considering some field theory, let's say like we have a scalar field theory, uh, phi, uh, phi is a scalar field. Then, uh, so it's defined by the wave function, uh, which is basically a product of delta function. So which delta function, which basically says this, the delta function basically sets this, uh, the field at this point and the field at this point to be equal. So does it make sense? Oh, um, okay, so uh, you're identifying those those segments. Yes, identifying like antipodal points. Uh, okay. So that creates a state if you view it from here, right? So like a uh -huh. okay okay so all, okay so all the antipodal each anti each point is identified with its antipodal yes yes that's the definition okay. of the cross cap state okay thank you so so in, yeah so that's actually an important point because like because of the antipodal identification uh, although we start from a cylinder so this surface is actually a closed surface and that's why it describes the Klein bottle. And uh, this partition function actually admits two different expansion. And the first one is called the tree channel expansion, which is basically to, uh, which can be obtained by inserting a resolution of identity here. So we expand uh, this cylinder in a closed string channel. And that, going, that is going to give you this expression. So we have first like a overlap between the cross cap state and energy eigenstates uh, defined on the uh, spatial cycle. Uh, of length L, and then it must propagate uh, 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 for distance R. So that's why we get this propagation factor. And if you further take R infinity limit, then uh, the le leading answer in the R infinity limit is given by a ground state in this uh, Psi L channel, in this closed string channel. And that's why uh, that is basically saying that uh, if you take compute a partition function uh, of the Klein model in some way, and then take the R going to infinity limit, you can read off the coefficient. And that is going to describe the, give you the uh, overlap between the cross cap state and the uh, ground state. Okay, so, so this is a tree channel expansion. And, and the other one is the loop channel expansion. It's a kind of analog of the open string uh, channel in the, if, if it were a cylinder. So, so let's consider loop channel expansion. So the, in the loop channel expansion, uh, we take the space uh, of a string to be along this way, this direction. But because of the antipodal identification, 
uh, this space direction, like a constant time slice, doesn't end here because it, it has to be continued to here. So, which means that uh, the complete uh, constant time slice is given by this uh, co combination of these two segments. And this basically means that uh, the Hilbert space is defined on a spatial cir circle of length r, length two r rather than r. And in addition, uh, if you want to interpret this Klein bottle partition function, uh, what you need to do is to first uh, time, time evolve this uh, line by L over two. Then uh, it gets identified with uh, this line. Uh, but the important point is that like, if you draw, draw an arrow, then you can see the directions of the arrows are opposite, which means that when you uh, want to express this uh, climb model partition, express this in terms of this time evolution, uh, you what you need to do is to first of course, like multiply this time evolution factor. But in addition, you need to multiply a parity operator because you need to flip the orientation uh, of the string uh, of the circle. So this is the definition uh, that you get. And if you uh, express it in terms of uh, parity eigenstate, you get this, this expression where epsilon psi two r is basically the uh, eigenvalue of the parity, which takes plus one or minus one, okay? And, and so this is the best thing you can do if we are discussing general massive quantum field theory, but in integrable field theories, you can do slightly better because in integrable field theories, states are labeled by like a momenta or rapidities of particle, much like in free field theory. So this is a typical like a labeling of the states. So you have a set of momenta or we often call rapidities as well. Uh, and and these because these have physical interpretation as a momenta of some quasi particles, uh, if you act a parity operator, basically it flips the sign. So that basically means that uh, if you want to compute a trace uh, or like an eigenvalue to trace of the parity operator, then uh, that is that gets only contribution from a state when uh, for for a states with p uh, for states where the set of rapidity is parity invariant. Because otherwise, if you ask the parity parity operator here, then you get a different state, and because of the orthogonality of different states, you get Zero. And in addition, uh, so, so, so the second statement is a little bit more non-trivial, but in addition, uh, if uh, the set of rapidity is parity invariant, you can also show that eigenvalues, which appears here, must be plus one. So I should also mention, I should emphasize that this second statement doesn't follow automatically from the first statement, uh, because in the first statement, I just said like uh, we can restrict the sum to a parity invariant state, but that doesn't say what the uh, parity eigenvalue is. But if you carefully look at uh, the structure of the wave function uh, in the integrable field theory, you can convince yourself that the parity eigenvalue is actually plus one. So combining these two uh, conclusions, uh, we can actually simplify this expression further in the integrable field theory. So first of all, we can restrict the sum to a parity invariant state, or more precisely, what's called parity invariant solutions to the beta equation. And furthermore, I replace uh, the parity eigenvalue by plus one. So there is nothing here. So now uh, we have this expression coming from the uh, loop channel. So if you equate loop in the tree, then we get this equation. So we we have this like a sum over parity invariant state. And if you take our infinity limit, then you can read off uh, this expression from which you can read off this uh, overlap. And so basically what we need to do is to compute the left-hand side. And the left-hand side, uh, is a little bit complicated because we need to sum over all possible states uh, and then uh, with this weight factor. So, but I should say that this is basically uh, computing, problem of computing some thermodynamical partition function in the limit in which the spatial volume becomes infinite. 
And this problem was studied, a similar problem was studied a lot in the past in the integrability literature. And there is already a framework to solve this problem, uh, which is called a thermodynamic beta andas. And the reason why it's called thermodynamic is because we, uh, we are considering something like thermal partition function. And in this case, the, uh, the beta, which is the inverse temperature is L over two. However, in the usual thermodynamic beta andas, we don't put disparity constraint. So, so the only thing we need to figure out here is to understand how to deal with this parity constraint, okay? So now uh, let me just explain how to deal with the parity constraint. So this uh, slide is probably the most technical slide in my talk. So if you are not familiar with integrability, maybe you can just like uh, forget about the, uh, about the slide for a while, but so let me but try to explain uh, how to deal with the parity constraint. So in order to deal, the starting point of this thermodynamic beta and thus is to basically formulate a, a kind of equation and satisfy these by these rapidities, uh, which is the analog of the periodicity condition. So, and so that is called what's, that is called the beta equation. And the beta, for the parity invariant uh, states, uh, the beta equation, uh, which is basically a periodicity condition for some excitation living here, uh, takes uh, different forms depending on uh, the number of excitations, or more precisely, depending on whether you have a zero momentum excitations or not. So if you don't have zero momentum excitation, then uh, the periodicity condition uh, takes the, this form. So this is the uh, beta equation, just apply to the parity invariant state. So here, uh, because we have, if we have a momentum P, Pj, then in, we sh should also have momentum P minus Pj because the uh, set of rapidities should be parity invariant. And if you want to uh, move one excitation around this spatial circle, then it must scatter the other one, another one, which is momentum minus Pj. So that's why we have S, S matrix of Pj minus Pj here. And in addition, like it also has to scatter uh, with other excitations, uh, which also come in pairs. So that's why we have a product like this. So this is based on the beta equation uh, for the parity invariant state when there is no zero momentum. So when there is a zero momentum, then a zero momentum state is not paired. So that's why like we have an additional factor here. So let's call uh, the, uh, the sector in which we don't have zero momentum uh, S sector and the sector which we do have zero momentum T sector uh, just for convenience. And the crucial observation here is that this, these beta equations actually are formally identical to the beta equation for the open uh, string or like a theory with, a theory with boundaries. So, so if you consider a theory with boundary, then in addition uh, to the uh, product of S matrices, we also need to include a contribution from the scattering against the boundary. And so this is a typical form of the uh, periodicity condition for the excitation or what's called beta equation for a system with a boundary. And in this case, uh, because particle needs to scatter twice, in order to come back to its original location, uh, it has like a product square of the reflection mat matrix or reflection amplitude. But in addition, like uh, when it comes back, it needs to scatter uh, with other excitations uh, twice, like one from this direction and, and, uh, and first from this direction and second from this direction. So that's why we get a product like this. So as you can see, like if you compare these two expressions, then indeed uh, the form of the beta equation are almost identical. Uh, once we identify this square of the uh, reflection amplitudes uh, with this factor for the S channel, S sector, or uh, this factor uh, for the T sector. In addition, uh, partition function for this parity invariant state, if you split into S sector and T sector, then it also takes a simple form, uh, especially if you restrict the sum to be just a positive rapidity, 
So now, uh, like the inverse temperature looks like L rather than L over two. And the only uh, weird part is that like for the T sector, we need to multiply this factor, which is basically coming from zero momentum, additional zero momentum. So this looks complicated, but the important point is that we can basically uh, recycle the result for the boundary problem. Okay, so that's the most important point. So what's the result for the boundary problem? Um, so again, okay, actually this slide is also a bit technical, but uh, so in the past people developed a way to compute uh, the what's called a boundary entropy, which is basically the overlap between the boundary state and the ground state, uh, which basically shows up when you expand this cylinder partition function uh, in this channel by inserting a resolution of identity. And the actual formula or details of the formula is not very important. Uh, but let me just show you the closed form expression. So the closed form expression is given by a ratio of Fredholm determinant times some free factor. And this Y is called what's called Y function, which is defined by this integral equation. So this star is a uh, convolution kernel. And this, cup, this K is defined in terms of uh, S matrix, uh, 2 to 2 S matrix of integrable field theory. And the Fredholm determinant is defined by this action. So the action involves this kernel K and also Y function. And most importantly, uh, the prefactor is given by this expression. And as you can see, it is the only prefactor that knows about the reflection matrix, uh, which basically distinguishes different boundaries, boundary states. And in addition, uh, this is a very technical point, but I should emphasize that there is additional minus uh, delta pi times delta function. So this is basically because uh, the beta equation allows, uh, so in the previous slide, I was talking about the beta equation for the boundary problem, but the beta equation allows u equals zero as a formal solution, but it doesn't correspond to any physical state. So, so in the final answer, you need to subtract uh, like a u equals zero. Because if you do the analytic computation or if you try to express, uh, write down some analytic expression for the boundary overlap, boundary overlap then uh, it doesn't know if u equals zero is a physical or not. And it actually, it, it automatically includes u equals zero as a contribution as well. So you need to subtract it by hand. So this is a very technical point, but uh, it's going to be important in the next few slides. Okay, so so the base so this is the final answer, but the basic idea of the derivation is the following. So it's again like it's the it's again it's coming from equating the expression in the two two channels. So as I said, if you ex expand it in the closed string channel, you get this uh, overlap. But if you you can also express this part of cylinder partition function using the open string channel. And, and then we get this expression. And if you take a R infinity limit, this sum over states can be replaced with a in pass integral of the density of particles. And as you can see that this uh, pass integral of the density of particles can be evaluated at the subtle point if you take large R limit. And if you compare this expression and this expression, you can see that the different subtles uh, corresponds to different sum over closed string states. And the subtle point equation is, uh, gives you what's called TBA equation, which I showed in this uh, slide. And, and the one loop determinant around the subtle point is going to give you the prefactor. And that's basically the reason why uh, the final answer is given by ratio of the home data. Anyway, uh, the data is not that important. Uh, the most important thing is that we can simply borrow this result and apply to the cross cap state. And the only thing that we need to modify is basically this part, uh, which knows, of, knows about the arm uh, reflection amplitude and actually also this part, as I'm going to explain. So let's start with the uh, S sector. So in the S sector, uh, we had this uh, beta equation. So, so, and this part gets identified with the reflection amplitude. If we were to identify this with the boundary problem. So what we basically need to do is to replace log of r by one half of log of su and minus u. 
uh, y one half. Be that's because uh, in the boundary problem, we have r of p squared instead of a single s. And miraculously, if you do this replacement, this part and this part cancels out completely. And in addition, in this uh, cross cap problem, we should not include actually this uh, pi times delta factor. Uh, that is precise. That is basically because uh, if you set uh, p equals zero here, then this equation is no longer satisfied. And the, the reason is like a, in the integral field theory, uh, s of zero, zero is minus one. So it, let's set like a p to zero. So here we have one, here we have minus one, here we have minus one times minus one, which is plus one. So the right-hand side becomes minus one, whereas the left-hand side is one. So p equals zero is not allowed, even as a formal solution in, in this cross cap problem, especially if you consider S sector. So that's why we don't need to subtract it by hand. And because we don't need to subtract it by hand and everything just cancels out, uh, this prefactor just disappears and we are left with uh, the ratio for the homo determinants. And on the other hand, uh, we can also do the same analysis for the T sector. So, so now the uh, beta equation gets modified to this expression. And again, what we need to do is to replace this with this expression. And, but here, uh, because we have like a, a additional S matrix, uh, U equals zero or P equals zero is allowed as a formal solution. And, and again, we need to subtract it. So that we, that's why we have this expression. And after this replacement, you can see that this part and this part cancels out, but there is something that's left. And that is going to give you this uh, expression uh, if you apply uh, the boundary entropy, if you apply the formula for the boundary entropy. And in addition, uh, there are some other pieces, but uh, like this, and, and this one basically comes from this part, uh, delta function. And furthermore, uh, there is like extra piece, uh, which is minus ML over two. And that is coming from uh, the way we express the uh, contribution from the T sector. So this is basically coming from the energy of the uh, zero momentum excitation. So as you can see that the uh, result in the T sector gets much more complicated as compared to the result in the S sector. But miraculously, this part gets simplified if you use the uh, thermodynamic beta and this equation, and it reduces to this expression. So, uh, so the punchline is that uh, although things are a bit complicated, and the final result is basically given by uh, taking a sum. And well, this was the result for the square of the uh, overlap. So if you want to get just the overlap, then you need to take a square root. And uh, we can also generalize, uh, so this was the result for the ground state, but we can also generalize the result for the excited state. And in the case of excited state, uh, this kernel gets slightly modified. And this can be derived from uh, this ground state result by doing some kind of analytic continuation. So the basic idea is that if, you, if, you're, if your QFT has several parameters, sometimes like if you do the, by doing the, changing the uh, parameter of the theory, you can change the ground state to some excited state continuously. And using this kind of trick, we can kind of guess what the expression for the excited state is. And that is going to be given by a simple modification in which the Fredo home determinant uh, now gets ex some extra contribution. And we can also take the limit in which uh, the spatial cir circle L becomes very large. And if you do that, uh, if you do take that limit, then this uh, what's called y function becomes it gets exponentially suppressed, and as a result, uh, we get some uh, sim simple ratio of determinants because like uh, this part also gets suppressed. So the Fredo home determinant becomes like a some kind of finite sum, and and uh, sorry, the Fredo home determinant reduces to some finite determinant, and is given by this expression. And so sorry, these, can I just ask yes. you? Yes, yes. <laughs> Hi, Shota, sorry. Uh, um, no so I, I had some nice questions like, uh, because it seems like you only assume that it, the model is just some integrable QFT solvable mm -hmm. by some beta or mm -hmm. something, and then you just impose this boundary mm -hmm. condition. But then do yes. you expect 
like you could take some can you take some cft limit of some massless examples or something like that um, yes uh, that's the next slide ah, okay okay so but even before that uh, mm -hmm. uh, so so somehow like do you expect that this uh, this boundary what will this boundary cross cap entropy count like possible uh, number of allowed uh, cross cap states in the model or like how, how do you interpret this entropy yeah it's um right so right so let me see so it's a bit like a, a boundary entropy or like a, what people often call g function i think it's some uh no extensive contribution to the free energy uh, uh coming from the fact that we have some extra cross cap state so so i think like a it's better to think up, up, think about it from the loop channel expansion. So the, in the loop channel expansion, uh, we have some uh, we have some like a thermodynamical like partition function, but with parity in circuit. So in some sense, like a, it's a kind of like a non-extensive contribution coming from the fact that parity operator is inserted in the trace. But but I agree, it's a little bit more tricky. Uh, to interpret physically as compared to the boundary entropy. Okay, maybe some some CFT limit will give some some hints. Yeah, yeah, maybe yeah, maybe one can try to relate it to some kind of entanglement entropy in on non orientable surfaces uh, into the CFT, but I haven't thought about it actually. Okay. Thanks. Okay. Yeah. Thanks for asking the question. So, so now, uh, so this is so all Sorry, these Shota, Yes. I, I have also a question. Yeah. Uh, so in this case, can you write a general form for the cross cap state? Um, e, okay. So in, indirectly, yes, because by doing this computation, we know all the overlap between the cross cap and the energy eigenstate. So this basically gives you the coefficient of the energy eigenstate. So, so take this coefficient and multiply the energy eigenstate and then sum over energy eigenstate. That is going to give you the non-productive uh, expression for the cross cap state. But right. I, that, yeah. But then it seems like the, the logic got into a circle that um, you start by mm -hmm. by calculating the overlap between the cross cap state with mm -hmm. uh, either the vacuum state or mm -hmm. the excited state and then you got some overlap mm -hmm. and then then of course uh, then you were saying that you can um, express the cross cap state as uh, the sum or linear right. combination right. of uh, those yes. two uh, those different states mm -hmm. um Okay, so so maybe let's say this. So in some sense, I avoided asking the question of what is the cross cap state by uh, going to the loop channel because, like in the tree channel, sorry, in the tree tree channel, you clearly see if you expand it in this way by inserting a resolution of identity here, you clearly mm -hmm. see the cross cap state. But in the loop channel, it's just like a, it's just some partition function with parity operator inserted. And what we did, what I did was to compute this expression exactly using the thermodynamic beta and that's. So in this computation, you never need even need to talk about the cross cap state. And as a result of this computation, I can read off the overlap between the cross cap state and energy eigenstate. So that is an answer, and it might not be very satisfying very satisfying for you but like a, and once we get the answer we can multiply this and then uh, write down the expression for the cross cap state yeah yeah i actually i'm fine with that mm -hmm. except that here we need to have a complete set of bases right uh, oh yeah. you, you are okay so you are asking 
um, let's see. So one thing I can say is that in 2D CFT, we can often uh, write down the cross cap state explicitly uh, because the cross cap state is defined in a, by a condition which is very similar to the boundary state. Uh, some like combination of the Vera Soro generator annihilates the state. So, and then you can try to solve that e equation. And here, um, even for the boundary boundary state, uh, if you just consider arbitrarily boundary state in integrable field theory, uh, it is actually not trivial to write down the state. And I think the best you can do at finite volume is like, again, uh, write down the analog of this. I see, I see. Yeah, it's, uh, it's indeed um, um, a hard problem because usually, I think probably in most cases, we don't know what we, if we can write explicitly the, the cross cap right. state. Yeah, right. Maybe. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Okay, no problem. So let me just go to mention uh, one particular cross cap, cross check, uh, which is to use the what's called the staircase model. So it's a model uh, with a single species of particle, and the S matrix uh, of the model is given by this expression. And it has a parameter theta zero. So it, it, it is actually a very interesting model uh, initially proposed by Zamolochkov. And what Zamolochkov did was to compute uh, the center charge or the ground state energy, energy on a cylinder using this S matrix and using some dynamic data on that. And what he observed is that like, if you take theta zero to be very large or and eventually to infinity, then uh, and then compute compute uh, the ground state energy as a function of the spatial circle, then it, uh, he observed that it actually exhibits a series of plateau like this. And furthermore, if you compute the values at plateau, then it exactly coincides with the unitary minimal models, like all these like uh, uh, PP plus one unitary minimal models. So this one corresponds to easing model, and this one corresponds to tree critical easing model, and so on. So this basically suggests that this staircase model basically like uh, interpolates between all the unitary minimal models along the RG. And so this model is actually like it does not have a Lagrangian description, as I'm not of just gave uh, like a miraculous S matrix. But assuming that this RG flow interpolates between unitary minimal models, uh, we can imagine, uh, we can try to do the computation for the P, uh, for the, sorry, the cross cap entropy, which we also call P function. And if you do the computation, again, it exhibits a series of plateau. And if you compute the values at plateau, you get this expression <clears throat> uh, for, uh, for the plateau corresponding to M's minimal model. And this actually coincides exactly uh, with the overlap between the cross gap state and the ground state in uh, A series minimal models. So this gives one cross check of our formula. Okay, so with that, uh, let's now uh, talk about the integrable spin chains in the remaining time. So again, uh, although I'm, my main focus is on the cross cap state, but again, like uh, let's start with the boundaries. So in the past, uh, people discussed two different boundaries in spin chain. So the first uh, setup people often discuss in the literature is open spin chain, uh, which basically corresponds to boundaries in space. So there is some boundary in space, in the space spin chain lives. And that is a simpler problem. Uh, you just need to uh, consider some, uh, like an open spin chain, which typically have like a, in which typically Hamiltonian splits into the bulk piece and the boundary piece. And this problem was well studied and there is also a classification of which boundary, H boundary preserves integrability or not. And, but more recently people are more interested in boundary states in closed spin chain. And this is more like a boundaries in time rather than boundaries in space. So because, so this is, this boundary state is defined on a closed string, closed spin chain rather than on open spin chain. 
And of course, like it's a little bit uh, ambig like I, it's not very clear what we mean by boundary in time because we are not considering some continuous field theory in which we can like a swap time and space. Uh, but um, people identify the analog of the boundary state in continuum field theory. And for example, if you consider like a spin up down, spin one half spin chain, uh, one typical boundary state takes this form. Like a, it's a product of like a two side state. And two, two side state is given by this kind of linear combination. So C0, C1, and C2 need to be a particular number in order to preserve the integrability. Uh, nice property like integrability, but um, so the details is not necessary in my talk. So as you can see uh, in this expression, so this boundary state in closed spin chain is almost a, almost a product state because the, what you need, first need to do is to define this uh, two side state, which is, a, which is actually entangled two side state, but, but afterwards you just need to take a product. So this is defined almost locally and much like a boundary state in field theory. So the boundary state in field theory is almost like a product, is also almost like a product state, precisely because when you define a boundary condition, you always define a boundary condition locally in space. So, um, and because of this uh, feature, uh, this boundary state in closed spin chain is short range entangled. And that's why it's, it provides an ideal initial state for studying time evolution of entanglement because then this state has almost zero entanglement. And by evolving, time evolving using the bulk Hamiltonian, well, sorry, not bulk, usual Hamiltonian, you can see how that entanglement grows. And in addition, uh, in integrable spin chains, if you pick some particular value of C0, C1, and C2, uh, you can actually uh, derive some nice simple formula for the overlap between the boundary state and the uh, uh, energy eigenstate. And that is given by this uh, ratio of determinant some, times some simple factor, well, non-universal factor, uh, which depends on the details of how we define the boundary state. So this was studied a lot by uh, these authors. And in particular, uh, people used uh, this nice uh, analytic formula to compute various quantities, time-dependent quantities in the context of quantum quench. One quantity is called the Loschmidt echo. So you take uh, some initial state and time evolve using the some integral Hamiltonian and then project it again to the same state. So this we take to be the boundary state. So actually this was not a good notation. I should write B here. And, and people did the uh, computation using this analytic expression and then observed some interesting features. For example, uh, if you do the uh, plot, plot it, then there is some known analyticity showing up. And uh, so this was just a result of the computation, um, but then they uh, discussed like whether one can see this kind of known analytic behavior uh, in actual experiment by cold atoms. So, so now, uh, so far I've been talking about the uh, boundary state uh, in closed spin chain. And the next question I want to ask is whether one can do something similar for cross cap state in closed spin chain. So the, as I said, like uh, the definition of the cross cap state is basically identifying a state uh, living uh, sides uh, which are antipodal on a closed chain. So the naive guess is to do the following. So we first take this entangled uh, state, which is defined for the side J and side J plus L over two, where L is the length of the chain. And then we again, just take a product. So this basically creates a bell pair uh, uh, between two sides, uh, which are antipodal. And because of this, uh, this state is actually long range entangled, unlike the uh, short, range in, short range entangled state uh, defined by the boundaries, boundary state. And for instance, if we compute some uh, entanglement entropy of the subregion, and if you use the boundary states uh, that, that I defined in the previous slide, then 
the subregion entanglement entropy as a function of the size of the subregion uh, goes like this. So it stays very small. So this is uh, one reason why the boundary, this is one evidence that the boundary state is short range entangled. On the other hand, uh, if you compute boundary, sorry, the uh, subsystem entropy in this uh, cross cap state, then it actually grows linearly until it reaches half the system size and then uh, decreases linearly. So in some sense, it's kind of like a very much longer range entangled and exhibits volume, volume low. So in addition, how uh, in this state actually turns out to have a nice feature that it preserves infinitely many conserved charges if you consider integrable field theory. And you can actually show that the, the state defined like this uh, is annihilated by this combination of the transfer matrix, uh, which basically is a generating function of the higher conserved charges in the integrable field series. So this, uh, yeah, I'm gonna skip this slide, but let me just briefly mention. Uh, let me just briefly mention that um, uh, the, the idea of proving this is very simple. So, so the idea, so basically like we just need to use the fact that the cross cap states identify uh, point antipodal points. And then the action of like the transfer matrix can be converted into this one. And using some uh, trick, you can also uh, rewrite it into minus T minus U. And then uh, that basically gives you the equality between uh, C, uh, T acting on C and T minus U acting on C. And so, and then like you can just prove this equation. So, so there is a simple, nice graphical proof, but uh, this is a little bit technical. So let me just skip it. And, but, but most important point for us is that um, if we compute uh, the overlap between the cross cap state and the energy eigenstate in the integrable spin chain, uh, like Heisenberg spin chain, uh, then we, by computing them, we found uh, actually numerically without a proof at this moment that they admit a very simple formula, which is again, given by like a ratio of determinants. And so this result is very interesting because first of all, it coincides with the asymptotic limit, uh, some limit of the overlap formula in integrable QFTs that I showed earlier. And, but most, more importantly, uh, it's similar to, but simpler than an overlap formula for the spin chain boundary state. So if you consider spin chain boundary state, again, you get this factor, but then there is always some non-universal prefactor depending on the details of the boundary state, whereas, for the cross cap state, in some sense, this prefactor is just one. So, so, so this is why, like, uh, uh, we call the cross cap state uh, the simplest uh, possible boundary state uh, in the paper. Of course, like, uh, uh, physically, it's quite different because the boundary state is short range entangled, and the cross cap state is long range entangled. But um, but the punch, but one important lesson here is that uh, the overlap with the, between the cross cap state and the energy eigen state is very simple. So it might provide a new tractable initial condition for the quantum crunch problem. And uh, I'm gonna probably mention a little bit about it in the conclusion slide, but I, should all, I also wanted to mention that uh, this formula uh, was kind of observed numerically using Mathematica. So uh, it's probably nice to have some uh, analytic proof, uh, which I don't think is very hard, but we just didn't do it. So now let me conclude. So, so the cross cap, so the punchline of the talk, as I said, is that cross cap state is integrable and Overlap with excited states can be computed analytically and is given by some ratio of Fred Holm determinants in the integral field theory or the ratio of determinants in the context of field, uh, spin chains. And in the, and as I said, like uh, there are similar stories for spin chains. And there are couple, several future directions. Uh, for example, one interesting question is to study quench dynamics. So one 
thing that I need to mention is that uh, there, there is a reason why people use the boundary state as the initial state of point dynamics. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, boundary state is uh, short range entangled. So that's why it's an ideal initial state for uh, studying the time evolution or growth of entanglement. On the other hand, uh, if you start from the, uh, the cross gap state, it's already like a long range entangled. So in some sense, like uh, the question that will be interesting to address in this setup is to see how this long range entanglement disappears or like a uh, reduces. And to address this question, uh, I think uh, interesting setup is to consider our system uh, in which uh, we have like a two different kinds of degrees of freedom. For example, there is a thing called like, a, sorry, uh, I should say spin color jello. There is a model called spin color jello Sutherland model, uh, which are basically like a particle moving in one dimension, one plus one dimension, but it also carries spin degrees of freedom. So in that context, one can imagine uh, first considering some state in which the entanglement is stored purely in spin degrees of freedom, and then ask how uh, it gets transferred to the, uh, this particle degrees of freedom. So this kind of question uh, could potentially be interesting and may even have some application to uh, uh, condensed matter physics. And, but in order to address that, uh, we uh, what we need to do is to generalize uh, our definition of the cross gap state to uh, this kind of uh, spin color Sutherland model or as a first step as a, to the color Sutherland model. And I think it's not so hard, uh, but again, like uh, nobody has done, done it yet. And uh, there are more technical generalization, uh, future direction, which is to generalize to a more general integrable field series. So although I didn't emphasize much, but I was in the talk and in the paper, we were discussing mainly the theory in which we only have a single species of particles. But if you have more species of particles, then uh, S matrix really becomes matrix and things become a little bit more complicated because we need to use what's called nested bettandas. But this generalization should be possible, but again, nobody has done it yet. And another direction to, is to apply this idea or like uh, to see whether there is any uh, observable in N equals four super mills, which is given by overlap between the cross cap state and uh, uh, energy eigenstate. So one thing I should mention is that uh, it is already known that the cross cap state shows up if you consider SON uh, N equals four super mills rather than SUN N equals four super mills. Uh, there is a nice paper by Pavel and his collaborators. Uh, but that setup is not uh, ideal for studying the overlap between the cross cap state and the energy eigenstate because energy eigenstate uh, in the context of N equals four super mills corresponds to single trace operator. And, uh, and the cross cap overlap between cross cap state and the energy eigenstate in the context of SON N equals four super mills is going to correspond to something like one point function of local operator. Uh, but one point function of a local operator is zero because of the conformal invariance. So in that context, uh, in the N SON N equals four super mills, uh, there is nothing to kind of compute or there is no observable uh, which correspond, no non-zero observable which corresponds to the overlap between the cross cap state and the energy eigenstate. So we need to find uh, some other setup which breaks conformal invariance. And, and uh, lastly, uh, I wanted to mention that uh, in 2D CFD, uh, we can actually have several different cross cap states because uh, when we compute the cross cap state in the uh, loop channel expansion, uh, I inserted the parity projection operator. But instead of parity projection, we can combine parity with some other Z2 symmetry, like a parity times some other Z2 symmetry operator. So that defines some kind of a charged cross cap state, uh, which is charged under the Z2 symmetry. And it'll be interesting to uh, define and study those cross cap states also in integrable field theory and integrable spin chains. Okay, so let me end here. Thank you very much, Shota, for the very interesting talk. Um, we have a few, uh, sorry, we have time for a few questions if somebody would like to, to ask. 
Uh, you already asked, but maybe I'll ask more. So thanks again for this nice talk. Um, I, I have one question and one maybe comment. So the question um, is, have you thought also about like finite size corrections or or have people even computed that in this integrable model like for boundary states? I, I, I was not following that development. Uh, but I was okay. um, right, so yes. Sorry, yeah, I should do it more. Right, so so like this is the expression uh, for the boundary like overlap or boundary entropy in integrable field theory. And it actually uh, includes all the finite size correction because this one over y gives some exponential decay. So if you expand this like a Fredholm determinants, all the terms are kind of exponentially small. So you're saying you don't need to take R to be very large? Sorry, maybe that I-, I uh, Sorry, so, so, okay, so R, R needs to be large. So that's why uh, it, that's important for uh, projecting to the ground state, but uh, L can be finite. And oh, sorry, finite, sorry, I, I, size, I, I, yeah. I, I, I mentioned, I, I meant something else. Like, okay. Uh, uh, I'm, I meant like some kind of analog of what people you you were computing like this kind of wrapping corrections and you know to some uh, to yeah the um, dynamic right but uh, this is actually wrapping correction like uh, the, the thing that appears from expanding this is a wrapping correction because like I, so y is basically e to minus e to m m m times like a exponential of mass suppressed by exponential mass times l. But okay, again, like I should emphasize, like there are two different problems that we can study. So one is to compute the energy of like uh, of this open system of a finite size. And the other is to compute the overlap of a closed system of a finite size. And both problems have been solved and people know how to compute a finite size correction. I see. Okay, thanks for this clarification. And um, so I, I just had one comment. So actually, I don't know if this, if this is in the range of your interest, but there has been some works by Monica, Guica, and Simon mm -hmm. Ross mm -hmm. on some kind of holographic uh, duals uh, of some uh, cross cap states, like in the geon geometry and doing some mm -hmm. kind of like analog of quench there. Maybe this is also interesting for. Oh, okay, okay. I actually indeed, uh, thanks for, uh, yeah, I actually didn't. Uh yeah didn't know much about it so yeah. right. i don't know to what extent this is like a robust team mm -hmm. uh, but I, if you have some universal conjectures on this g function or something maybe one can also test it in this holographic setup indeed, of indeed. the geometry yeah okay thanks anyone else would like to ask Yeah, I have a question about um, uh, the studying of the quench dynamics. Mm -hmm. So, um, so I guess the uh, the cross cap state in the model you mentioned is still like some. Uh, it's not in CFT. It's not a CFT theory, right? Mm -hmm. It's still some integral bow mm -hmm. theory, and um, because it always confuses me that. Um, since in CFT one can define this crops uh, cross cap state by using the Virzoro generators, mm -hmm. uh, is there also an operator definition for mm -hmm. cross cap state uh, in integral models? Yes, uh, in some sense the best thing that I can say is this one. So, so normally in CFT cross cap state is defined as like a, as a state that is annihilated by some combination of like T and T bar, right? Right, uh, right. So, so, okay, so it's a little bit confusing because I'm using the same letter T, but this T is a little bit different. This is like what's called transfer matrix. And the transfer matrix is a generating function of higher rapidity, like a higher concept charges in integrable theories. And U is basically like a, some parameter. It's a generating function and it's parameter. 
And if you consider close spin chain, like a there, uh, okay, sorry. The, the eigenstate of the closed spin chain is the eigen, also an eigenstate of this uh, operator transfer matrix T of U for any value of U. Uh, but the cross cap state is defined um, by the condition that it is annihilated by T of U minus T of minus U. Is it an analog? Uh, because uh, I'm more familiar with like boundary states, then it means mm -hmm. somehow. Uh, there's no energy flux that is uh, going across this boundary, mm -hmm. right? Right. Uh, and uh, so in this case, when, when, when you write it in terms of the transfer matrix, uh, what kind of physical mm -hmm. meaning can, can, can I think of it? Okay. Um, yeah, so the physical, yeah, the connection is not that clear because it's true that like also for what's called integrable boundary state, uh, it's known that uh, this condition is satisfied, but uh, there are also like a non-integrable boundary state for which the, this condition is not satisfied. So if you apply this condition to the context of boundary state in spin chain, then it just like a selects a subset of the allowed boundary state. Whereas uh, in the con the condition that you mentioned should be allowed in any boundary state, right? Because it's just a condition on the energy flux. So, yeah, so it's a little bit more like a specialized condition coming from integrability. But yeah, I don't know how to make the connection more precise. Okay, I see. But it's st still quite nice there is an operator definition yeah there is yeah some definition uh -huh. okay so this is for spin chain system yeah uh -huh. i see maybe a related question when if one is going to do a, a, a quantum quench with a, a spin mm -hmm. chain at the initial starting point mm -hmm. then the hamiltonian uh like how how one can think of this Hamiltonian or it can have different Hamiltonians. Yeah, so I guess the idea is that we just use the same Hamiltonian much like the boundary state, like, uh, I mean, uh, the Hamiltonian of the system that you chose. So yeah, you should really think of it as an analog of the boundary state. Okay, I see. Yeah. Thanks. It's a very nice talk. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. Is there anyone else who would like to ask a question? If not, then uh, we just thank you again, Shota, for the very nice talk.